All right. So welcome to the SWAC show. Um, every, every month we try to find some hot topics that we think are interesting to an audience that's interested in zero waste, but we're not gonna talk about zero waste tonight. We're gonna talk about advocacy because SWAC means zero waste advocacy. So there's lots of kinds of advocacy. There's the nice kind where you drive up to Sacramento, you're polite, you put something on the table that everybody likes and agrees with, and they pass a bill and the governor signs it and you go home happy. We're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the hard kind. We're gonna talk about advocacy against heavily entrenched political interests with lots of money. And we're gonna talk about how to make changes because if you missed cocktail hour, we were talking about some of the changes we've made in zero waste. We were talking about how we don't like to put organic material in landfills anymore where it just makes methane and causes even worse climate change than we've already got. We don't like to talk about recycling plastic because you can't really recycle plastic and it just ends up in the goddamn ocean. So we make incremental changes. So I was thrilled to have two incredible women come to the night show, one of whom is not yet here, but we're gonna, we're gonna stall until she gets here. Um, both of these women have accomplished really great things on really big issues in very different ways. And so we're gonna start tonight with uh, Cynthia Chandler, who is an, an attorney. She is currently the director of the Bay Area Legal Incubator. And she's gonna talk about her work in work, working with women who have been sterilized against their will in California state prisons and is featured, the featured person in a documentary that's now available on Netflix and other places called Belly of the Beast. And I'm not gonna repeat the things that are in the movie with her, but I'd like you to like, uh, we're putting the, a link to the, to the website for the film on right now. I, I encourage everybody to watch the movie. I encourage everyone to make a, a modest donation to the nonprofits that are mentioned in the movie. But the thing that struck is striking to me the most in the movie was that California, a, as blue state as there could possibly be, has laws and policies that are causing, were causing women to be sterilized against their will that come from Nazi Germany. I mean, who to think, who to think that California would have Nazi laws and policies on the books. And who would think that there would be people in California that even to this day support those policies? So I've asked Cynthia to talk about how she got involved in the effort and some of the hurdles that she and her colleagues had to go through to make incremental change against these policies. So Nan Cynthia, let me, I'll, I'll start with a softball question. Okay. What is, the, what is the Bay Area Legal Incubator? Oh, what I'm doing now. So the Bay Area Legal Incubator is a business accelerator for attorneys launching social emissions law businesses. Um, so the idea is to take advantage of efficiency technology and artificial intelligence and uh, use it to be able to uh, make legal representation affordable and accessible while also building sustainability into law businesses um, for diverse attorneys. So, and for me, it's sort of a democracy uh, of the rule of law project. Um, I really think that we won't have a justice system until we really dramatically shape who shapes the law and who uh, can, both work within that profession, but also significantly shape what the laws are and what they look like. And for that, in part, one of the things we need is a much more diverse pool of attorneys uh, and serving disenfranchised communities. And so the incubator is trying to make that happen. And John's been an awesome uh, mentor for some of our litigators in the group. So I'm going to come back to the, the shaping the law part, but tell me about the the disenfranchised people that the Valley tries to help out or represent? Well, yeah, so about, okay, there's this, <laughs> I'm sorry, there's this neoliberal construct, which I'm not a particular fan of, which is called the access gap. Um, and the idea is that um, what it's really referring to is the, the 
sort of gap in uh, the widening gap of people who are able to afford legal representation for civil matters in the United States. Uh, and the US ranks almost at the very bottom of all countries, whether whatever part of the world they're in, in terms of how, what percentage of our population can actually access our legal system. Uh, and about 30, 40 years ago, maybe about 20% of uh, people would be representing themselves in court. Now it's about 80% of people are representing themselves in, in US courts. Uh, and the outcome outcome disparity between what happens if you're represented versus not represented is quite huge. Uh, so it's contributing, this lack of representation is contributing to our system really being an unjust system. That said, just accessing an attorney is not enough to create a just legal system. Um, and that's why my project, the Valley is trying to do both, both provide people representation, but also start shaping the law. Um, and the people are really, honestly, I think of it as the 99%, right? I mean, most people in the United States cannot afford to pay an attorney some uncapped number uh, amount of money when they're like most attorneys now are charging between 500 or more dollars an hour and for some unknown number of hours and most people cannot afford to get into a contract where they're responsible for that kind of a bill um and so the idea is to provide representation with flat fees and moderate flat fees so that people can set up payment plans and understand what their bill, bill really is and also have more ownership in the actual representation as well. So when, when Cynthia first asked me to get involved in Bali, I was thinking, great, I'm going to get a trip to Indonesia out of this. But that hasn't happened yet. So, Sadly, no. <laughs> so it, it sounds like, you know, access to legal services is pretty important to you. And there must have been some point where it came to your attention that women in prison were being sterilized. How did you come to this issue? Okay, so uh, more than being a lawyer, I identify as being a prison industrial complex abolitionist. Um, and I'm since 95, I've been 1995 and been part of a movement that's been working to resurrect the idea of prison abolition, um, which fell to fell apart really due to the efforts of the FBI and Quintel Pro during the 1970s in the United States. Um, and so uh, through that work, um, I, I used the fact that I was a lawyer to um, gain access to people in prison and to engage people in prison and thinking about what a justice system would really look like if it truly was just. And I specifically wanted to work with people in women's prisons because the vast majority of people in women's prisons are the survivors of spectacular levels of violence, interpersonal violence um, in their home lives before going to prison during their childhoods, most of which is never recognized um, as even being a problem in our society. Uh, there's no safety and no accountability for that population. And then on the flip side, most people in women's prisons are serving disproportionately longer sentences than people in men's prisons in the United States for crimes of survival. So they have a really unique perspective in that they understand what it's like to have survived gross acts of violence and they also understand what state violence looks like um, and disproportionate punishment. Um, and then the conditions inside women's prisons as all prisons um, are ripe with many human rights violations, right? So, so I originally started working with them and uh, one of the organizations that I co-founded, we trained up about a hundred people in California's women's prisons women, uh, to be human rights documenters. We train them on human rights law and how to collect data and construct their own research to figure out what they wanted to document in terms of where we would start. Like where would we start in challenging this massive prison industrial complex? Um, and over and over and over again, uh, the documenters said that they wanted to focus on the ways that families were ripped apart. And originally, the focus that we were looking at with sterilization in prison really focused on how imprisonment itself acts as a form of birth control. 
um, and removing people out of their communities and removing them into locked institutions really in effect isolates people from their families and removes, especially if they're locked up during their entire reproductive years, uh, denies people the right to have a family um, and cuts off lineage ties. So that was where we started. And then in uh, 2001 or 2002, I got a letter from a young woman who was in her early 20s. I was about 30 at the time. Um, and she had had a surgery, she had had surgery, but somehow it took her longer to recover. And she has symptoms that she couldn't understand. Um, and I got this letter and she wrote because of the work we were already doing with people inside. Um, I got the letter and immediately thought that she sounded like she had had surgical, she was suffering from surgical menopause, that she had probably had a hysterectomy or something, but that wasn't what she said she had had done as a surgery. So I got her medical her records. Medical and then, records and then, oops. oops. Might want to might mute. Want to mute auntie mm -hmm. there we go okay uh i got her medical records and, and had the misfortune of discovering that in fact she had been sterilized during that surgery without her knowledge uh and then having to meet her and tell her that um and it was a really profoundly horrible way to meet another human being mm -hmm. to her credit um a real, I mean, she's really a genius. Her name's Kelly Dillon. She, she immediately honed in on the fact that not only had she been harmed by doctors who had lied to her about what had happened to her body and continue to perpetuate the lie when she would ask what had happened during that surgery, but it was also an indignity that both of us were young women. Um, and me as like a upper middle class white woman with a lot of educational privilege and class privilege was able to read her medical records and she couldn't even read her medical records um, and because she literally didn't know how. And how was it that just really based on these privileges, I knew more about her, her body than she did, right? And uh, that was, I thought, incredibly brave for her to bring up. And we had a long conversation about the role of racism both in healthcare, healthcare delivery as well as in the imprisonment system it's overall. And we made a commitment to each other that we were gonna to try to get to the root of what had happened to her. And in the process, we found a dozen other people who were sterilized without their knowledge during surgeries. And then eventually found um, almost 200 people who were sterilized during labor and delivery when having children inside the women's prisons. Um, and it sort of started a whole campaign uh, that took, it's taken 20 years. And, and this year we finally won reparations for everyone who was sterilized uh, during that era. Um, and, and hopefully the sterilizations have stopped, although they've at least trickled down. I'm not convinced that they've stopped. So we're, we're, I'm gonna come back to that, but I'm gonna do a sort of a lawyerly annoying thing and try to summarize a little bit. Yeah. It sounds Oops. like you, you came to this from a point of view that prisons are bad. And as part of that, you sent people out to, to chronicle the different ways that prisons are abusive. And in the course of that, you found this issue about reproductive mm -hmm. rights. But it sounds like there might have been, might be other things that you're also looking at. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was a, we were, we, one of the things we were documenting was the right to family. We were also doing a lot of documentation around the violation of the right to health, um, which included a real focus on premature death and dying in prison. Um, and we, and we also were able to use the most conservative United Nations definition of genocide and document how, uh, imprisonment functions as a genocidal tool in the United States. And we weren't able to get, so, I mean, talk about feeling like a three-headed monster or alien coming into a room. I mean, we were talking about these issues in the 1990s, which is at the height of the prison expansion boom, both in California, as well as across the United States. Um, and it, as weird as it might sound to call myself a prison abolitionist now, uh, in 1995, 2000, it was way weirder. Um, and we couldn't get much headway 
with uh, challenging any of these things in the United States, but we could get headway with the United Nations. Um, and so we filed multiple reports with the United Nations and they sent, um, they were so impressed, they sent with the research that people in prison were doing, they sent a special rapporteur on violence against women to meet with the documenters inside prison that we had trained up and who were doing the research with us. Um, and and took it very seriously and wrote a really strong report exposing how the United States was engaging in, in behavior and patterns that were tantamount to torture under international law, as well as genocide. And part of what that work was about was also shifting the whole jurisprudence or sort of legal theory of what genocide is, as well as the right to family and the right to health. Um, so it was inclusive of the needs of people in prison and actually challenging the system of imprisonment as it was playing out in the US. Um, but anyway, and then I think the, the real story, the advocacy story though, is like, okay, how did we take this like UN thing? Uh, we built political will there, but how did we parlay that into actually making change happen in the US? Um, where really, I mean, almost any room that I would go into, I was treated as if I was a conspiracy theory nut to say the least, <laughs> so. So, we, I, I don't, I'm trying to relate this to the zero waste stuff. Mm -hmm. It's it's not the same at all. I don't even, I'm not trying to imply it as, but it sounded like you were taking on a big problem, prisons and the abuses mm -hmm. of prisons. Right. And trying to do something about that. So in the environmental area, oftentimes, you take on a big problem, you try to whittle it away. And I'm not saying, you know, challenging, you know, sterilization is whittling it away. But is, is there part of the overall strategy involved yeah. to, to do that? Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what in the prison world is called non-reformist reforms, and that was coined that by Angela Davis. Um, so uh, in any, the idea is that in any kind of uh, social problem, um, if you try to, you know, if you try to do piecemeal reforms where you have a systemic root cause of the harm, you run the risk of those piecemeal reforms actually fortifying that institutional structure that you're trying to challenge. Right. Um, so for, for me in the prison context, like one of the first things I worked on in 1998 was uh, a thing called compassionate release. So I created the legislative process where people who are terminally ill in prison can win their freedom um, in order to be able to die with their families and say goodbye to their families before they die. Um, that process in my mind was a baby step towards decarceration because it was showing the legislature that there could in fact be political will for a decarceration effort, um, starting with something sort of easier, right? Um, like, you know, and literally like some of the work was about allowing the release of, of brain dead people who did not even know that they were imprisoned, um, which California has at any time about 250 brain dead people in our custody that we're paying for. Um, so it seemed like this important piecemeal thing to do. And it was also, in terms of the root harms of imprisonment, again, allowing families time to heal. Um, but what we found really quickly is after we won that victory, almost overnight, uh, the National Institute of Corrections and the California, in California, the California Department of Corrections co-opted our language to justify the building of new skilled nursing facility prisons. So um, they co-opted our successful legislative language on allowing, which was very bipartisan, and we got especially a lot of support from Catholics around allowing people to die with dignity um, and to provide palliative end-of-life care. They co-opted our language and used it to justify building thousands and thousands of prison beds across the country, right? So I would call that an epic fail, at least. <laughs> You know, I mean, like literally within within two years, I could see how the exact language I created was used uh, against our ultimate end goal. And also, instead of fighting to get people free, I was spending my time fighting to get people into an isolated prison, right? A special prison supposedly for them, um, where frankly, they weren't getting any care. Some of the 
skilled nursing facility or hospital wings that were built, for example, were literally no different other than having a piece of notebook paper slapped on the wall saying hospice. Um, so what we tried to do instead was figure out a litmus test of what we were willing to compromise on and what we weren't and how we would actually gauge if we were making long-term progress with our piecemeal reforms. Um, and for us at the Organization of Justice Now that I founded, as well as another organization called Critical Resistance that I'm a co-founder of, we came up with this idea of asking for literally anything that we were thinking about doing. Um, one of the questions would be, um, are we squeezing out prisons? Are we helping rendering prisons obsolete? Um, are we, and part of that was, then are we investing in prisons or are we investing in people? So in terms of where there would be investment, we didn't want to fortify the state further. We really wanted to invest the people. And our, our thinking was like, for sure, in, in historic systems of slavery, um, and we were using the word abolition, right? Um, there was a need to keep enslaved people alive um, until they were able to be free, right? But if I have limited resources, I'm not going to funnel my resources into the slave owner to delegate those resources to keep the slaves alive, I'm probably going to invest instead in the lay peer health providers, the there are like the, the midwives or whatever within the peer group or people who are smuggling in food, right? I'd invest my resources there because that would actually be investing in the people and their own skill development and their own empowerment um, and keeping them alive. Uh, so anyway, I think that that's applicable to that kind of logic is applicable in any social justice movement, right? You have to figure out what is the bottom line. What is the fundamental question that you have to ask that gauges success, right? Um, and, and stay away from reforms, even if they seem politically viable um, or if rhetoric seems politically viable, but you can readily see how it's gonna be twisted in order to be harmful to you in the next go round, um, staying away from that, even if it seems pragmatic in the moment. I could spend hours asking you follow-up questions about that stuff, because it's really interesting. I'm going to come back to the litmus test part. Okay. In, in, in our world, our resource recovery world, we have what I'm sure you've heard of, you know, plastic bag bans. Mm -hmm. and, and cities started passing them. And the, the plastic people started challenging them under CEQA and started winning those cases until the city of Manhattan Beach finally did, did an ERR and sustained its own ban upon which the state of California finally decided, oh, well, that's something we ought to take up. So what they did to take up is that they passed a statewide ban, but then they also said, we're gonna preempt all local ordinances that come in after us. So no one ever gets to have a more restrictive ban than the state has. That's one way I think, of, that's a species I think of what the kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah. where, where things get compromised. But we also, in our world, we, we work with a lot of people. A lot of us have different ideas about how to achieve things. How, how do you have a coalition of people and come up with a litmus test of what's important? <laughs> um, sometimes it's the sub coalition that has like the shared values. And, and, and honestly, like in any of the legislative work that I've done, you know, obviously I'm working across party lines, let alone am I working with reformists versus abolitionists. Like I, you know, there's a huge range of folks who are allies. Um, in the sterilization stuff, for example, some of our allies, most helpful allies were Trumpian Republicans in uh, North, North Carolina and in Virginia, who already had passed reparations for historic eugenics. Um, and why, they're- Why did they do that? <laughs> they did it because in the first wave of eugenics in the United States, and actually just to be clear, it wasn't Nazis that brought it here. We actually, the U.S. trained Nazi doctors and they took the practice to Germany. Um, the first wave of eugenics really targeted working class, uh, actually working, I would call really working poor boys, white boys, and many Catholics were targeted for sterilization. So in the 19... 30s, um, 1940s, there were boys um, in orphanages um, that when they would turn basically 16 years old, they would be told either 
you can go to this other institution where you will be mandated to do forced labor indefinitely, or you can agree to be castrated. So it wasn't even a vasectomy, they were actually castrated. Um, and in the California, a lot of the uh, critique of eugenics was focused on the sterilization of women of color, specifically Latinas um, who were uh, sterilized in mass numbers in Southern California and black women um, also throughout the state. But in the Southern part of the United States, a lot of the people targeted were again, working class white boys, um, which also was true in parts of California after during the Dust Bowl as well. Um, and Okies were targeted for sterilization. But that, you know, I think it really spoke to um, a lot of conservatives um, that want to portray themselves as champions of the working class, whether that is true or not. Um, stuff yeah. It, in terms of working with Trumpians, mm -hmm. yeah. How, how do you feel about that? I mean, I can think of a situation where there's a recall election going on. The mm -hmm. Democrats want Governor Newsom to, to stay in office. There is a fair number of Republicans in parts of the state that don't want that. And some yeah. of those Republicans would probably support some of the resource recovery things that I would advocate for. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to go to them and say, use this against Governor Newsom? Is it okay to go to Trump people and say, please help us? Well, good question. I mean, but it also was part of a strategy of actually shaming the liberals in California that these Trumpian Republicans had already done reparations. So there's two states had already started to do reparations for eugenics. And so it was particularly the damning of liberals in California who, who pride themselves in being pro reproductive justice um, to, to have to face that level of shame. So, um, <sighs> I think what it came down to, we didn't stop what we did not do. So here's the things we were not willing to compromise on when working with them. We would not take race off the table in California and talking about the issue. Um, the Trumpian Republicans, I do not doubt, hold deeply, deeply racist views. Um, we were not willing to remove a focus of race and to whitewash the issue within our state and within California. Um, and all the survivors had testifying, except for two, uh, were women of color. Um, there were two men in their 90s who were um, sterilized forcibly when they were teenagers uh, who have been helpful spokespeople as well. Um, let's see. So we wouldn't take race off the table. We also didn't take the speak of reproductive justice off the table. It also wasn't, it wasn't a political hindrance or, or like a liability for us to use that language in California. And so we weren't going to change for them. Um, we also, interestingly, you know, the Trumpian Republicans, we held a private screening of the movie Belly of the Beast for a, with a Q&A that was hosted by um, a retired, very powerful California legislator woman. And it combined some of the members of the California's Women's Caucus who were the most left-leaning women of color with Trumpian Republicans from the South on this panel. Um, interestingly, it was this like historic moment and this divisive moment for the country to get everybody to come together, but none of them wanted to record it and neither did we. Because honestly, like the language that the Trumpian folks were using is not what I would actually want to use as persuasive with the general public and what I would want um, outside in the broader universe. And yet it, in fact, did speak to a lot of California legislators. And I'll, I'll say that our <sighs> reparations uh, push was voted for and passed by every single member of the California Assembly um, on both parties with no one abstaining. So we were able to get unanimous support. Um, and if you go back 10 years even, I couldn't even walk into like the most liberal Democrats office and get them to take me seriously. They were basically acting as if I was totally a mentally disturbed person who was bringing them some bizarroid piece of information. Um, and they would be like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> so I walk away. So I, I don't know. But can back. I, but wait, I do need to say one thing about the recall. I, I do think that the, it's interesting that you bring that up because I actually think the recall is highly eugenic. 
Um, I, I think that you know there's a way that we are asking in this country. We are ask, initially we're asking um, for our elders and our medically vulnerable people to sacrifice themselves for the economy. Um, there were Republican legislators openly saying that. Um, and now this recall has basically pushed Newsom into a political corner where he feels he can't close things down. He has to keep things open. Um, and now really, I mean, with schools opening, right, and, and the rise of the Delta variant um, infecting and causing serious illness in children, now there's this question of are we sacrificing our youth now to this um, for the economy, for someone's political uh, election, which is really ultimately the combination is fascism of combining eugenics along with um, capitalism and political power. So um, I, anyway, I, <laughs> I'm back. not big fans of these folks. <laughs> so let, let's go back. You start out with the prison abolition idea. You send people into the prisons to document abuses. You find an abuse very palpably in this letter that you get, and you talk to this poor woman, and somehow you think, oh my God, you know, what is happening here? So at some point, there must have been an idea that we got to put, we got to put a stop to this. And you know, because we're lawyers, that we can put a stop to this because by going to court or by going to the legislature, and sometimes both. So at one point, do you stop and say, we got to do something about this? And what's the master strategy that you come up with to do something about it? Sure. So, I mean, first comes to that litmus test. I mean, the number of horrific things that we were exposed to on a daily basis was sort of spectacular. So I did have to say no to many people with many horrific things happening to them on a regular basis. Um, we tended to shy away from using litigation as a social change tool in the prison context because most uh, impact litigation around prison conditions has historically now in the last 30 years shown to just fortify the prison system and allow more and more money to go into the prisons and the brick and mortar of the prisons and not actually change conditions. It's If you're looking at the conditions, they have not been successful. Um, so, and part of that's also because the people in prison are uh, legally very vulnerable. Um, we have a uh, Prison Litigation Reform Act that is federal that's also been replicated in the state level that so radically limits uh, damages and creates all kinds of obstructions to bringing claims that it's almost impossible to get representation and to bring claims forward for people in prison. So anyway, courts were just not how we felt we could really make a difference. And it was also a case of first review. The law that already existed making it illegal to sterilize people for the purpose of birth control inside prisons, which is a federal law and that has been replicated on the state level, um, had never been tested in the prison context. And uh, it had been tested in mental institutions, but not in prisons. And we were wary with more conservative, a more conservative court that there could be an interpretation that would, where if we lost, we would actually open up the door to wide scale um, sterilization of people inside women's prisons. And we started being able to document that similar practices are happening in eight other states as well. A huge fly flying across me. Um, and so we knew that at least eight other states are violating federal law already around this. And we didn't want to open up the door to make it common practice. Um, so anyway, so uh, yeah. I can ask you about that because mm -hmm. I, I have a little, not as much as you, but I have some experience with impact litigation and mm -hmm. for the non-lawyers here, how, what's the, what's the risk of losing an impact litigation case? Well, in our case, the state was already making, being very vocal. And so there's a federal law that says any entity that gets federal dollars cannot sterilize people in prison for the purpose of birth control. And the reason is that consent in an environment where you're ever, every move, literally anything you do is controlled by threat of force is not real consent. And so you shouldn't permanently remove someone's fundamental right to have a family in an environment where their consent to that procedure would never be genuine, okay? Versus consenting to some other kind of, of thing. Um, so what we, but what the state was saying was that this untested law really only meant a federal dollars 
were used to pay for that specific sterilization. And no prison in the entire country uses federal money to fund its medical care. So if, if that interpretation won in a court, then, then it would mean that that ban would mean nothing. There would be no ban anymore. And we would start from ground zero of it being a completely reasonable thing to do. Um, and so the risk of losing was huge. And to make matters worse, um, you know, we only found the people who were sterilized that we found, which was only about a dozen people by accident, almost from reviewing their medical records. They hadn't known they were sterilized which means that the state had access to all the patients that they sterilized and who they were. We had access to the numbers of people who were sterilized, but not the names of those patients. So the state could kind of control the narrative. They could hand cherry pick the one and only person who might have a sympathetic reason for why they were sterilized, who wanted to be sterilized and use that narrative to win in court. Um, so we were very seriously worried that we would do great harm um, for you know, people across the country, if we took that strategy. So in the movie, it it does document a, a, a trial that was held in the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. I think of the same woman that you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you know, it, the issue was whether she had somehow Im impliedly consented to the sterilization procedure. What? Um, why, why did you go that route? So we decided to do an individual case in. Her her have her have an individual case rather than a bigger broader class action where we were do, be doing testing this law um because it seemed such a clear-cut case um she uh was supposed to have like one cyst removed from one ovary and said she ended up being fully sterilized um she was told that that wouldn't happen unless she had cancer and she didn't have cancer and then in fact after the operation she was lied to and told that nothing was removed when in fact she did have both ovaries removed and, and so i mean she was also lied to it was like such a clear case so let, let me yeah. guess let me guess maybe all of what she what she was told and what she told the doctor may not have been fully documented perhaps no actually highly documented. She ended up losing on a procedural ground. Um, when she was waking up from surgery, um, the anesthesiologist said something that confused her about it being a longer operation than he had thought. And she didn't quite understand it because she was just waking up. In the trial, the defense, the government attorney brought up the fact that this had happened, brought in the anesthesiologist, and then they, in trial, argued a procedural issue that her statute of limitations should have started to run at that moment, because at that moment when she was still groggy with anesthesia, um, she should have known something was amiss. Um, and uh, the jury believed that the anesthesiologist said that. And therefore, the jury found that um, the jury found that she had missed her statute of limitations in filing the case. Separately, the jury was asked whether or not they would award damages. They were polled about whether or not they would award damages, and they said even if she had prevailed, they would have given zero damages, and they basically devalued her reproductive capacity completely. Um, but she ultimately did not lose on the merits. She lost on the procedural issue. How did you recover from that? You know, it's interesting that we had outsourced that case to a large law firm that was doing it pro bono, and two of the attorneys left the law after the case. They were devastated, like bona fide, really upset. And these were like big, fancy, big law attorneys. These weren't like social justice attorneys. They were just totally horrified. Um, and Kelly was at first almost really in mourning, and then then she got angry. I mean, honestly, you know, it, it's sort of, I mean, Kelly talks about it now that she wanted this like happy ending. She wanted to feel affirmed. And instead she got yet another case where our legal system really failed her. Um, and she decided that she, she wanted to really change how the world works. Um, Kelly is now a commissioner in, uh, in Los Angeles and uh, runs a uh, nonprofit organization that builds a community empowerment in Watts, California, um, and is really doing all the things that she 
envisioned she would do. And now she talks about it that, you know, obviously it was this horrific chapter in her life, but it also spearheaded her uh, finding a way to actually really, really build power for her community and herself. So how did you rally? You, you, you have this big issue. You want to do something about it. You have more or less a test case, which goes horribly wrong. Yeah. How, how do you rally and get back on track to what you're trying to do? Um, I'm totally an exercise addict. <laughs> um, I mean that seriously. Like, I don't mean, I don't mean like meditative, like mindfulness. I mean, like at that time, I think like three or four spinning classes a day, like crazy addiction to exercise. It's better than cocaine though. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I mean that seriously. Um, and, uh, no, I think it, it, it was also difficult because at that same moment that that was happening, we also were totally unable to build political will around the legislative avenue of relief. Um, and so my whole team was not only dealing with this loss, but also dealing with the fact that we were being discredited left and right. And there were, we had by that time, we had uncovered evidence that uh, there had been this big burst in the numbers of sterilizations that were happening and it, it had actually been recommended the sterilization steril, doing sterilizations was determined to be a cost effective measure for the state in a Department of Corrections memo internal memo and meeting um, to save money for the state on foster care. Um, and so we had we had uncovered all these powerful people who had been part of this process of pushing forward this new campaign to sterilize people in the prisons. And those powerful people were putting pressure on the funders for of our organization to defund our organization. Um, they were putting pressure on our allies to not support our work. It was it was a really 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 difficult time. Um, and I. I don't know. I mean, Kelly and I have talked about this. I mean, honestly, I think the thing that kept us going is that we both pathologically just don't quit. I mean, we just don't quit. I, I, you know, and there were many times where we would have conversations where it's like, you know, the last one standing wins. We just have to fucking be the last one standing, um, you know, and just and keep trying to make this work. We leaned heavier on the international angle and started working on getting domestic media on the international work we were doing and focusing on recruiting two things actually <laughs> one thing was like a little bratty of mine but the strategic thing really was that we focused on um recruiting an investigative reporter to really unveil the story and give all the data to them to replicate and so that could be their data not ours recognizing that we were being treated as if we were crazy Right. So we worked with the Center for Investigative Reporting and let them take all the credit for unveiling this and turned it into a mainstream press issue and used the international coverage to leverage that. Um, and then the second thing we did is um, I started working on pressuring the allies of uh, some of the powerful people who were involved. So there were two uh, very famous feminist criminologists who are consulting with California's Department of Corrections who are implicated in all this and the head of the Women's Department of Corrections uh, for the state. Everywhere that they went and spoke, literally everywhere they went and spoke, I would get myself onto a panel and present the data um, with their names attached to it on a PowerPoint slide showing how they had been part of this decision um, to start sterilizing people in prison. Um, and I started getting phone calls from people who we knew in common, some of their allies being like, you know, you made this person cry at this event. And I was like, you know, it is really sad. It's horrible. Sterilization abuse is tragic. I'm really sorry that she was crying. It is sad, isn't it? And yeah, you know, I just, and I, I really, honestly, I spent, I honestly, it may have been a little more vindictive and not really healthy, but I spent like two years chasing them the same way that they were chasing us. Um, and it did whittle away their support. At the end of that two years, when we got the media attention that we wanted, I went back to those women that I had been chasing and said, look, um, you can be the hero of this and we'll let you redeem yourself. You can literally be the hero and help us roll out the solution. Um, and so after sort of vilifying them, we turned them into heroes, which made me go home and vomit, but, <laughs> um, but it strategically worked. Um, so two of the three agreed. Um, and two of the three started being evangelists for the solution that we were putting forward and we let them and we let them take credit for sort of being heroes in that situation. 
And it's, Which whatever, is, it's whatever works, right? So it yeah. sounds like you have a devastating court loss. You're not quite comfortable with the the court approach to making this change because it, you know, it could just get worse. So I think I heard that you started to go internationally in the hopes mm -hmm. that the message yeah. would filter down locally. And you also, you know, actively shamed people that were against you. Well, only because they were actively shaming us too. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> and and then we let them be the heroes, right? We totally we let them be the heroes. So tell too. me about the going international and filtering it down to local. Yeah, I mean, really that was about figuring out. I mean, look, we were a tiny little organization without a lot of resources. So everything was like highly impact driven. So, you know, we would do research to figure out which uh, reporters we thought really, really would be likely to do stories that we wanted domestically and then spoon feed them um, stories in the speak, in the language that they wanted. So not like general press releases, but like literally like, getting meetings with them or appointments with them or finding people who knew them like getting an actual in and then framing the story in their own language that they're regularly reporting with um and that that was much more productive than doing broader media press releases especially given that we were being looked at as if we were completely batshit crazy um and we also looked for we the reporter from the center for investigative reporting who finally did pick it up and run with it um he really wanted to build a name for himself i mean he was a young reporter uh he saw that if he made this into a really great story that he would probably get a lot of accolades for it and he did um and you know, and so for him, when we were, when I was approaching him with it, um, you know, we made it, I made it very clear that he could have all rights to claim that it was his data, his story, he unearthed it, he's sort of like, you know, the ultimate hero of this situation. And so I think maybe one of the lessons learned from all this too is like, you know, just throw ego out, like ego does not matter, like the mission matters, um, and just, you know, chase that. Well, but you had to stoke right. his ego for, so ego kind of. Did. Yeah, well, you yeah, but well, taking advantage of that, right? It, it was very clear from talking to people who knew him that he would care about that. So skipping ahead, there's a lot more I'd like to talk to you about, but just skipping ahead, what do you, since, since you've picked up this issue a long time ago, it's focusing really on reproductive rights. Where, where have you succeeded? What, what, what has happened that's been good since then? So in the last 20 years, um, there's now not a single reproductive justice or reproductive rights conference in the United States and actually, frankly, nationally that doesn't talk about prisons and the impact of prisons on reproductive rights. Um, we've like we succeeded in totally infiltrating and building bridges between those different movements, which is important. Um, we. Uh, we created a sunshine in California. We created a sunshine statute that um, made it clear that what was happening was already illegal. We ma created mandates that the state has to publish all kinds of data publicly whenever and if ever it sterilizes one. It makes it very difficult for them to do this kind of abuse again. Um, not impossible, but difficult. And now we won reparations. Um, our we did a lot of interviews with people in prison to determine what a success would be, like what would be justice. And they repeatedly said they wanted safety, like they want the abuse to end. Um, and so uh, part of the reparations bill also requires mandatory notification of the uh, people who are sterilized. The state has to go through all of its surgery records for, since 1979 forward to identify anyone that it's sterilized. And it has to work to identify where that person is and contact them um, because we felt that until people actually knew what happened to their body that the violence doesn't stop um, there had to be accountability um, and the reparations is is really a piece of the accountability uh, and another piece of the accountability is is uh, making sure that the history of eugenics is not totally lost. So there's also, the bill also mandates that there's a series of monuments decrying eugenics that are gonna be placed throughout California at different epicenters of the eugenic mo movement. Um, and just recognizing that, you know, monuments actually do have power in shaping history. Um, we felt it was important that, that that get sort of institutionalized through monuments throughout the state. Um, and now we're replicating this out 
with the help of this movie, Belly of the Beast, we're replicating it out, this movement out across other states. Um, and we're in conversation with other communities where there's sterilization abuse happening and so that it can be a model that can be roll out as well. Well, that, that's part of why I wanted you to talk because, you know, yeah. California is, and, and the Bay Area too, is seen as a leader in recycling resource recovery. And a lot of the ideas that have been generated here do, you know, expand to other places. Tell, tell, tell me about the reparations and how, how, that, how that came to be and, and what it's about. Reparation, pay, pay, paying women who have been sterilized. Right, I mean, part of what we wanted to do is actually conjure up and connect what we were doing to the, the movement for reparations for black slavery in the US, United States. Um, Part of what we wanted to do also was to recognize the fact that most people who have been imprisoned in particular are not going to be able to avail themselves of legal representation. And so we wanted them to be able to have actually a financial remedy. Um, and while it won't make people whole, it is at least a significant, meaningful um, remedy. Um, and then there, so there are two other states, Virginia and North Carolina, that have done a repar that have provided reparations for people who were sterilized under historic eugenic laws. And so we had a model too that we could rely on, so we could point to that as a legislative model that we could build from, um, which makes legislators frequently very happy when they have at least some piece of what you're proposing has like some origin somewhere where it's succeeded right. um, and played out with, and and also I mean, it also allowed us to make a, a fiscally sound. A, a, an argument focus it focus on fiscal responsibility. So we could say to the state, like, look, right now you have a lot of open liability. You have all these people who don't know that they've been sterilized. Were people to find out they were sterilized, they could then sue because they had no knowledge that they were sterilized. So there's all this open liability. This reparation plan provides the ability to to close off and seal off basically those liability containers, right? So it benefits both the person harmed, but then also the state on a fiscal level. Um, yeah, and anyway, and then we also thought that it would help build momentum for the movement that is pushing for, movements that are pushing for other forms of reparation. Um, and it would uh, help build momentum for people pushing for reparations for similar kinds of abuses, both across the US, but also globally. And already, like I've been contacted by people working on um, the sterilization of indigenous people in Canada, um, by some folks who are working on um, for sterilization issues in other parts of the world. Um, so already there's also sort of a global interest in this topic too. Well, I wanna open this up for questions in a moment. I don't know if uh, our, our next speaker is actually available on, or on the line or not. And I, I think so, I okay. think so, yeah. No, no. Yeah. And I could talk about this for a long time, but before I open it up for questions, what is next to, for you to do? What, what's the next step? What, what next do you want to see happen? <laughs> next for me, what's making me lose sleep is implementation. So this, this model for legislation will, will only be as good as its implementation. Um, and so that's really like the test, like in writing out this reparations plan, like I'm sort of the only human being who has this rubric in their head right now of how it's supposed to actually work. Um, and so the next six months is going to be really important to figure out, like, is it actually workable? Is this something where people can actually avail themselves of this remedy? Um, and, you know, and how also, how will the outreach strategy really work? Um, and so anyway, that's, that's the piece that I'm working on in coalition now. Um, and that will help inform how it rolls out in other places too. And, and who besides you can do that, I guess, is one of those questions. That's a really, well, <laughs> I'm giving myself six months to transfer knowledge so I can move on and do something totally different. I've done this for 20 years. It's time for me to like pass the torch. Um, so I've been, um, I've been identifying uh, different organizations that might be willing to serve as sort of a referral panel to help people get representation to help them do these applications. Some of the applications will be very simple, but some won't. Some of the survivors are in their 90s or older and really are going to need help, um, even if it is a simple application. Um, 
and uh yeah anyway there's the um i'm just trying to i'll be trying to train up a fleet so i'm using there's a new um provisional licensing program for the state bar. And I have one of those provisional licensees um, who's putting in 10 hours a week volunteer for the next six months, basically, um, who's gonna be working on creating a self-help manual for how people can access their reparations themselves. And then also a training curriculum, helping me with a training curriculum for training other lawyers and, and just community members and how they can support people in the process. Well, Cynthia, thank you. Oh. And I'm, now, I'm going, now I'm going to transition and find out if anybody has questions to ask you. David? Yes, um, I had a quick question. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I guess, yeah, one question, maybe a comment earlier when you're talking about, you know, uniting with the Trump supporters. Um, <laughs> I find that maybe you'd find common ground with the uh, rights for your body and along with why they're anti-vaccine currently. Um, I would think there's some common ground there, right, on your, uh, you know, just... Although body. they don't usually care about the rights of women to their own bodies. Hmm. They <laughs> seem to care a lot about vaccines, but not so much around reproductive health. Um, really, I think the faith the faith thing seemed to bond people better. Like, people were really motivated from a space of faith, which honestly can be somewhat reproductive, uh, reproductive rights oppressive. Um, like, you know, like, I think honestly, like some of the people that we're using as allies really do view many women's purpose as being baby producers. Um, right. And that was, that's one of the reasons why this is such an affront to womanhood in their mind, which is not at all how I view being a woman. Um, yeah, but, uh, but they were definitely bonded through their faith around this issue. That's Jeremy. So like traveling as extensively as I have, like I've seen some crazy stuff like this is absolutely like blows my mind. Like the fact that it happens here is something that I don't know. I've, I've seen it in other places and it's always like, I don't know, I guess I've reflected on those times and been like, oh, well, that would like crazy stuff happens in the US, but not stuff like, it's like, I'm just completely blown away by this whole thing. Um, but I, like, I was thinking when you were doing this, did you look into like juvenile detention centers? Like, is there something like that where they're doing it to even younger, like yeah. women in, in this process? Cause that's well, like, mm -hmm. um, this summer, this last summer, there was a scandal in Los Angeles's County jail where they were, it was exposed that they were providing very high levels of estrogen to some boys who had been diagnosed with behavioral problems. Um, high enough levels of estrogen that the boys were developing breasts. Um, and it radically, it, it's also very dangerous to give estrogen to people who have not finished growing because it stunts growth. Um, but so I'm, we're, I'm working with the attorney representing one of those boys um, to to really help him understand and shape what was happening to the boys in that facility it, in context of what was happening at other facilities um, around. And, and there's been for a long time, there's been um, for a very long time, there's been sort of rumors of boys being given uh, hormone therapy in the juvenile facilities. We haven't seen the same evidence of girls being um, sterilized while giving birth in juvenile facilities, but I'm sure it's there. I mean, it's, it has been exposed in ICE the ICE detention facility in Atlanta this last year. Um, so yeah, I, I honestly, like our, our investigation was really just limited for what our resources were. Right. Like, it seems like it's almost like a Pandora's box. Of just yeah there's so many different ways to maltreat, especially when you get to the juveniles and it's even just sleep deprivation can change like oh, yeah. the whole chemical imbalances. And it's just like, yeah. Yeah. It's, you. It, it's, and it has such a tremendous impact on people's bone structure and brain structure when you start messing with their hormones um, at a young age and sleep deprivation can do that and all kinds of things. It's really shocking. You know, with your global perspective, I mean, one of the things that, that I've 
found, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how this happened in California on such a scale. So we've identified 1400 questionable sterilizations and that's now, and that's just the ones we've identified in the last 20 years. Um, and how did this happen in California, which is thought of as like a bastion of liberalism, like how in the world did this happen? And there is a correlation between the rise of eugenic practices and the rise of fascism and white nationalism specifically um, in many parts of the world. Um, and so it's, it's sort of interesting that we're in a political moment where we're starting to really see that come to fruition in many ways um, across the US too. And so I, that was one of the other reasons we were really happy to win this victory now in the US um, and in, in California and be able to amplify it through a movie and through other ways because it seems like we're at a particularly dangerous moment for seeing another resurgence for eugenics in the US. Well, we're also clearly at a dangerous moment with climate change and we've got a lot of zero waste things that we can do about that, which we're trying to export to other states too. <clears throat> any, other, any other questions for, for Cynthia before we move on? I did I want, I did want to say, oh, go ahead. Dan? I did want to say that Nancy's on the call. She, I think she's on a phone. Is she? <clears throat> yeah, and so, you know, if you want to move on to that, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> one thing I, I wanted to mention is that, the you know, the be careful what you wish for kind of thing has happened with recycling again and again. And one of the people on the call right now is Jerry Gillespie. He knows this firsthand. I do too, from experience. The minute you start getting something going that looks like it's profitable, what happens is the government swoops in and gives it to a waste company and then they screw it up. And that's happened again and again, over and over again. And it even happens with, uh, you know, government does it, uh, but also the industry itself does it. So um, it's a like scary situation. Like, like privatizing prisons probably. Yeah, it's very similar. I think it's, you know, when I when I heard you talking about that, Cynthia, I immediately started making connections to what we've experienced. I think one that's just... Ones, one of the big ones was right in Berkeley where the city of Berkeley actually broke into the recycling operation that was being run by a nonprofit, stole a part, and then went to the state and claimed that the bailer wasn't working, that they had just disabled in order to try to uh, give them the, the whole idea was to give the business lock, stock and barrel to a, a paper broker who was uh, kind of sharky enough to, to take it. No. Well, that's why I wanted to talk about advocacy because advocacy against the things that we've been talking about tonight are hard and they're not pretty. And, and you, you, you have to ally yourself with people you might not otherwise go to dinner with but these, they're important issues. And I, Cynthia, thank you for coming. I mean, I- You're very welcome. There's actually a lot more parallels between what you're doing and what we do than I'd, I'd actually thought. So I appreciate your coming. You're welcome to stay for the, for the next session, <coughs> next segment. Um, I actually would love to hear it. So I'm okay. just gonna lurk if that's okay with folks. That's perfect. <laughs> We're just now starting to wake up in recycling to the need for, um, racial and economic justice uh, and, and for entrepreneurial uh, activity among uh, people of color and all kinds of people. That's, that's really a kind of a significant change that's going on within the recycling advocacy movement right now. So moving on, um, the other amazing woman I'm going to interview this evening is Nancy Gurrell, which I, who I don't see on the screen. And I, I trust Dan that she's here. Well, I don't know for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's touch. I know okay. she's on a phone. She's not on a, an actual computer. I, I, I can't even see her on the phone, but before we get to that, she, we have, uh, Dan created something called the recycling archives where we have oral interviews with pioneers of the recycling movement, meaning people my age or Dan's age. Susan Kinsella is, is the director of the program. And we each month on this live show, we highlight one of them. 
Um, tonight, we're going to highlight Nancy Gurrell, who I'm going to interview shortly. Um, Nancy has, has accomplished a lot, although she's, she doesn't like to take credit for much. Um, she was a board member and president, some part, sometimes president, for the Berkeley Community Conservation Center, which runs the drop-off aspect of the Berkeley Transfer Station. She is a longtime Berkeley activist, and you know, a lot of things start in Berkeley. Um, she was one of many members of the Berkeley Citizens Action political party, among them Tom Bates, Lonnie Hancock, Mayor Gus Newport, current Senator Nancy Skinner, uh, Nancy's husband Mark. And Although she wasn't the leader of that group, she did a lot of work for that group, including a lot of um, illustrations. She's a very uh, talented artist. Um, she's worked for, done a lot of stuff for NICRA. In fact, I would call her the NICRA artist in residence, although I don't know if there's official title for that. So she's done a lot of stuff. And tonight I'm, we're gonna talk to her about a couple of things that Berkeley did, that it was way ahead of the curve to do, that she participated with, one of that was converting uh, Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Another was banning styrofoam. But before I talk to her, and I'm still not seeing her, um, Susan Kinsella is going to read a couple of excerpts from the interview that she did for the archives. So Susan, could you tell us a little more about the archives and then do the readings? Yeah, thanks. Um... The concept for the archives is that there are a lot of people who started many of our current kinds of recycling programs back in um, like uh, starting with like the 1970 uh, first Earth Day and then beyond it. And as they were developing what became our recycling system, there were a lot of visions and values um, that had to do with supporting entrepreneurial activities and empowering communities that have frequently gotten lost along the way. So we thought that it was really important, first of all, to get these people's um, memories because there's not been a lot of that collected in the recycling field in general. And second, to um, be looking at what was it that was um, encouraging their actions then that could help us reframe things now and put it back, put recycling back on a, a solid kind of footing uh, as it sort of wobbles at this point. So um, what I wanna do is read from some of what, uh, I interviewed Nancy a couple of years ago and um, I wanna read from some of the discussion that we had. And then Bonnie um, has a number of her illustrations that she's gonna be showing as we go along so you can see sort of examples of what she does. So is it okay if I start? Um, so um, as uh, we've talked a little bit about, uh, Nancy Gurrell's husband, Mark, had been college roommates with Dan Knapp of Urban Ore. And so when both of them got married, the two couples became fast friends. Nancy st started um, putting her artistic skill to work on behalf of recycling and anti-incineration issues. Um, and as John just, described, she's been very involved in Berkeley politics, including being on the steering committees of recycling organizations and also being deeply involved in political campaigns. But tonight, what I want to talk about is the influence of her artwork. Can so put, it, Bonnie, can we put some on the screen? Yeah, we're going to do, we have a, okay, it'll, I'll, it'll show up in just a minute, I believe. Okay. As Nancy tells it in her Recycling Archives interview, so this is a uh, what she was talking about when we did the interview. You know, at first I didn't think I should be recorded for the recycling archives because what I did was not really part of the recycling story where people rolled up their sleeves and got the job done, but I was part of it. And this is, um, one of her political cartoons with recycling as Cinderella being told that she has to fund herself while the collection companies get all the tipping fees and payments. 
And I think that I just I think this is a wonderful cartoon with great illustrations in it. Um, two, of, two of the people there actually are identifiable as Berkeley uh, heavyweights on the burn plant side. They were in favor of the burn plant at that time, which is why the smoke is coming out of their mouths and you know floating off. Yeah. This yeah, is one of our most brilliant cartoons, absolutely. Yeah. And it's still a big problem that recycling is expected to be self-funding. Meanwhile, the garbage companies are getting lots of the payments that really should be going to recycling as well. Uh, so back to Nancy's an interview, um, she says, I'm an illustrator and a writer. Dan Knapp asked me to do a cartoon strip featuring a character called the Lone Recycler. So we're gonna switch over to the Lone Recycler image. Um, Dan would call me up and we just ramble on about the recycling movement. Eventually at Dan's bidding, we composed a comic book about the Lone Recycler. Dan and Mary Lou provided the initial storyline and I embellished and continued it. I wrote most of the dialogue and drew all of the characters. We wrote the comic book as a team. Dan's enthusiasm was catching and Mary Lou put in great ideas and Mark, her husband as well. It was a great, great, great working team. Mark put in horrible, horrible puns and jokes. So <laughs> we came up with characters such as Otto Biala, my name for him, who was the mayor of the town of Slabberg. There was Dr. Frightenstein, a mad scientist, Madison Hatter, who was a marketer, Polly Vinyl, this is one of my favorite names, a vamp who dressed in a low cut black satin gown, and Greta Garba, an archaeologist from the future who was researching Slabberg's ancient history, which means before recycling. Now, as Nancy continues, in the story, the lone recycler discovered this solid waste stream running through the town. And I think we're gonna, yeah, um, have it up there. Um, he was fascinated because it had many useful objects floating by. So he cast his fishing lure into it and he wondered why this waste stream exists. He's horrified when he goes into a store and notices all the overpackaging. He's especially shocked at these plastic coffins that poor harmless strawberries were encased in at the time. There was also a terrible burn plant. It was menacing, scary looking, in a fearsome place. It was a fortress, a castle-like thing, putting horrible chemicals into this lovely neighborhood. And inside it was a lab run by Dr. Frightenstein, who wore thick glasses and a crazed expression. Thankfully, in the comic, as well as in real life, the recyclers won and Slabberg became Wonderberg. About 5,000 lone recycler comments, comics were printed and all but a few have been distributed. This comic book is a cultural artifact from a tumultuous period in Berkeley's political and recycling history. Dan thinks it's a natural for a musical or an animated movie and he wants me to do a libretto for it. It might really work. Nancy also used her creative artistic skills in educating young children. We're gonna switch to a, um, a picture that's relevant to that. Um, I took a job at the Oakland Child Care Center in after-school daycare, as well as at the Albany YMCA's Kids Club. I brought a lot of my artwork into projects with those kids. I wrote plays in which the kids were gods and goddesses. We made a Julian togas. Every kid got to be a god or a goddess. Later, my plays featured Mother Earth and there were ogres and trolls. It was so much fun to watch these kids come out and sing the songs that I wrote for them. All the bad boys in my group wanted to be the ogres and the trolls. And here's one of the songs I wrote for them. And I'm not gonna sing it, but you can tell by the words in it, probably what it sounded like. And it goes like, we're the ogres and trolls and we're bad, wicked souls. We pollute and chop trees, endangered species, oh, please. Clean water and air, shucks, we really don't care. We've got money on the brain, so the heck with acid rain. One of the plays began 
with a kid who was Perseus. We called him Percy for short. In the play, he woke up from a nightmare about the environment and decided to prevent those bad things from happening. He called in all the gods and goddesses. Thor had his lightning bolts, other gods had other powers and all came together with their special skills and together they saved Mother Earth. And so as you can see, Mother Earth also shows up in this beautiful poster of Nancy's, which I, I, I really love the, the way that she drew it and um, think that it's really effective. Now, the Recyclones, Nancy's characters from the Lone Recycler comic book, came to life when the city of Berkeley hired somebody from Duck's Breath Mystery Theater to put on a series of performances based on them. Wavy Gravy was the MC, calling out to the kids who were actors, let's do the recycle, let's do the bo bottle bop, the can, 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 and the bundle boogie. And I think that just must have been the most wonderful. Apparently, there were a series of performances, and they sound just wonderful. Uh, and one more of Nancy's illustrations. This one was an educational ad that Urban Orr ran on the back cover of Bay Nature magazine, showing how recycling continually recycles, recirculates resources. So I just think that all these illustrations are amazingly beautiful and they were very effective too. I think they're still effective and have a lot to teach us. This one is based on um, scavenging at the Berkeley landfill, <clears throat> which I did for a while before I started Urban Ore off the landfill site. But um, I got a chance to walk around on garbage from everybody that was around, you know, from a, it was a regional uh, garbage facility. And so I got a pretty good clear idea of what the categories were. And at the time, there were about three or four categories that the waste industry recognized. They were metals, glass, paper, cardboard, you know, all the kind of usual stuff. But there's way more than that coming in. So being out there, I got a chance to see what it was. And there were, it, it sort of resolved itself into 12 market categories. And the idea is that if you get all of the market categories and recycle them, uh, or reuse them because reusable goods is one of the categories, then you have zero waste. So you don't have a need for landfilling or incineration anymore. And that's, the, that's what that last illustration is about. It shows where it all goes. It's also very practical because the kind of equipment you need to handle some of the categories, you can share between the categories. Um, so, for example, recycling has uh, six it has five different six different uh, categories that go into it, and the compost area has a bunch more. But and in each of those can be set up as different parts of a purpose built facility uh, to be able to handle all this stuff, and it's all fueled by tipping fees, which are the fees that you pay to make things go away legally. And it assumes that recyclers get paid for doing that, which is one of the big struggles that's still going on all over the world. Because what happens is the waste people get that money and that's what actually fuels wasting. So you have to take it away from them and give it to the recyclers instead. And that is starting to happen. It's just, it's, it'll take probably another 10 or 15 years for this to actually work its way through. But uh, it has already started. And uh, I think there's growing understanding that recycling is disposal and that as such, it, re it requires and needs and should have disposal service fees equal to that which powers the entire waste industry, which is one of the most profitable industries in the whole United States and the world. And I think that what Nancy does is, is so essential. She uses art to distill complicated issues and 
things that could take lots and lots of words to explain into a picture that people can get through the image, the understanding about the issues. I, I wanted to follow on with that. Um, you mentioned that Nancy did a lot of work with kids. I, I know that of her too. And I'm gonna say this as much for Cynthia as for other people who may not know it. One of the best pieces of political theater I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of political theater, was in Berkeley at the city council a couple of years ago when they were considering a ban on single use disposable products which was a big deal. And it took a lot of effort, mostly by Martin Bork of the Ecology Center to galvanize enough you know, support across the different sectors to get it passed by a kind of timid city council. But the, the biggest piece of political theater that I thought was effective was a teacher at a Berkeley school who brought several members of her class to speak. I think it was a third grade class. And they got up and one little girl held up a, a mason drawer smaller than this. And she said, we're a zero waste classroom. And this is the total amount of waste stuff we haven't been able to recycle for our entire class for the entire year. And it was half this. I couldn't, I thought that was incredible. Um, I also have a one recycler copy. <laughs> so I, I don't know if, if Nancy's on the line yet. I don't see her. I'm sorry, but she I, I talked to her a little while ago. She's got Mary Lou's phone. She does not know how to get on to Zoom. Mary Lou thought that she could do it, but she, um, she can't. She says, I poke things and nothing happens. So that sounds a little bit like my recent trial experience on Zoom. Um, you know, we're, we can't help that, but Dan, yes, that means it falls to you to tell the story. Okay. So 30 or so years ago, <coughs> now, um, an activist in Berkeley that Nancy knew named by name of John Curl, along with Nancy decided this upcoming Columbus Day celebration that the Berkeley city of Berkeley was planning didn't sit very well with them. And they said, you know, we, we got to do something better to this. So Nancy got involved and helped catalyze this thing that took hold first in Berkeley. And now it's taken hold all over the place in the country about instead of celebrating Christopher Columbus, we ought to celebrate indigenous peoples. But the advocacy of the whole thing, I think from my understanding of the story started in Nancy Gurrell's living room on Mendocino Avenue in Berkeley. And if Dan can tell that story right now, I'd appreciate it. Well, Mendocino Avenue um, is a really nice street and Nancy has a very large um, house there uh, among many other large houses that her husband, um, uh, a painter, and she bought a long time ago, but then they split up. And then she married Mark Arell, my best friend and the architect that I worked with on so many things. At the Berkeley, one of the Berkeley food co-ops, and then eventually um, it moved um, into um, a park block right next to the city hall. And so every year they had to get a permit from the city, and that became a big deal. So they needed a lot of people to be able to run interference for them and interpret the city for them. And Mark and Nancy were extremely well connected because they were both active in one of the places in Berkeley had gotten involved heavily involved in getting people elected to city council at one point 
uh, the city council was eight to one in favor of their coalition. Uh, so they had a lot of power between the two of them. And so they could go into those city offices and go up to uh, floor five and talk directly with the mayor and talk directly with the, the best staff and get things done. So the, the indigenous people then would meet usually for a couple or three months going into the powwow, which became Indigenous Peoples Day celebration eventually. But um, that's how that's kind of got going. And again, Nancy would make corn for them. So, uh, and then they'd sit around and get convivial in various ways and, uh, and talk shop. And that's how they got things done. So Indigenous Peoples Day was their idea collectively. Nancy really won't take credit for it. She says, no, it was a, always a, a group endeavor. Everybody participated. I'm sure they did a lot of consensus decision making because that's the way those things work. And, um, and out of that came Indigenous Peoples Day. And when it became a thing in Berkeley and the Berkeley City Council passed it, probably on the consent calendar, I'm not sure about that. But a lot of our things have passed that way. Some of our best things have passed that way. Um, when that happened, the press picked it up and, and suddenly it was a thing everywhere. It became a meme, if you want to use that word. It went all over the world. And now there are hundreds and hundreds of places that have celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day as a substitute Columbus Day because Columbus uh, didn't discover America. He, you know, they were all here. They're the Native American people. And so uh, this recognizes that fact and puts Columbus somewhere else, maybe in a museum somewhere where we can figure out what happened in the colonial era. So advocacy started in the living room kind of. With That's right, absolutely. And I saw it happen again and again. I wasn't there all that often, but when I did, it was really interesting because here are all these folks sitting around uh, being convivial with each other and working these things out. And there'd be about 20, maybe 30 people. Some of them would stay overnight because that house was big and Nancy had two children who had already left. So there were a couple of extra beds so they could sleep here and there. And uh, they were just always open to that. That was one of the ways that things got done because these folks would come in from rural areas. They were not usually urban people. They were tribal people and they still had tribal identification. So they'd come in and they'd sit around with each other and have a, have a chat with each other, a powwow and get things done. That's how it worked. So, so the takeaway, I guess, is if we ever have in-person meetings again on anything, is serve popcorn. Well, serve popcorn, but don't also, also re keep in mind that, and I've had a lot of experience with this, the best ideas a lot of times come out of groups of six, maybe eight, maybe 10, as, at the most, maybe 15 people meeting together over a period of time getting themselves together and then getting it, something out there that makes sense for everybody. You've got to make your legislation good for everyone. You can't make it be something that just helps you. That's not the way it works. If you do that, everybody will see right through it and you'll be dead in the water before you even know it. It's got to be something that is the best thing it's kind of like, you know, I forget the one who came up with this, Jeremy Bentham, maybe uh, the best thing, you know, the, what a, somebody help me out here. The, um, the best thing for the most number of people, something like that. I don't remember the exact phrasing, but uh, that's basically what you have to aim for. So if you're, so I think that's a wonderful synopsis, but for someone like Cynthia, she has a small constituency, relatively speaking. She has a constituency that 
most people don't care about. So the good for them kind of isn't the good for all these other people that don't care about them. How, how does she get there? Well, I think she's figured it out um, fundamentally. When she can get the Trumpists to come in because they feel like, you know, I don't want my body to be invaded. Uh, I don't want my kids' bodies to be invaded. In my, this is not what uh, freedom is all about. They're, one of their big values is freedom. You know, you can see it now all the time. It's been warped and screwed up really badly by a lot of bad actors. But it's basically a pretty fundamentally good idea that gets kind of twisted uh, into other shapes by people with evil intent. But the fact is that if you have good intent and the good intention shines through, most of the time I think it works out. You know, you can, you can lose for sure. And I've lost myself several times. There's some really epic losses that I've sustained. But after you do that, you know, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off and you start all over again. And that's, you know, you, it, people see that happening and they say, well, there must be something going on here. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's something I can get behind. And I think uh, Cynthia has figured that out. I think her constituency seems to be plenty big enough because she's won some pretty darn big victories and she's gone through some pretty hellish times too. And she's been vilified, so have I. Um, you know, that, that comes with, that goes with the territory. But again, you know, the good really does win out somehow. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, thanks for standing in as proxy for Nancy also. Um, she would love to have been here. Uh, you would love to have heard from her. She's a really, really super wonderful person. She, she's everybody's cool grandma. So, <laughs> so turning, then transitioning one to one more thing, which we have on our agenda. Uh, usually we give a legislative update. Doug Brooms, my co-chair, wasn't able to attend tonight and, and give that. But in in the meeting, Dan has circulated something that, you know, is is on the same subject that we've been talking about: advocacy for a big thing. So, Cynthia, the the recycling people know that burying organic material causes creates methane. That's a bad thing. But we have something that it's it's a little ambitious to say we can save the planet with it, but we can make a start because. We know that there's too much carbon going into the air and that's a big problem. But there is a technology that exists in our recycling world that draws carbon out of the air back into the soil where it can do, do good things and be, be nutritious. So finally, through advocacy of a number of recycling organizations, a bill has finally been introduced in Congress hopefully as part of the, the Biden infrastructure package, I don't know, but introduced in Congress, that gives compost its due, that says it's a conservation practice, provides money to small steel composters so that they can do what the Marin Carbon Project is doing and increase soil composition so it takes carbon out of the air. And so I asked Dan, because he's connected with the folks at the Institute of Local Self-Reliance who have pushed this bill to, to read the press release from the bill and to, and to talk about what NICRA and other people can do to support that bill, because that really may not all by itself help the planet, but it sure will help. So Dan, could you go ahead? Certainly. Um, so the, the following statement was issued by Brenda Platt. Uh, director of the Composting for Community Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance in response to the introduction of the cultivating organic matter through the promotion of sustainable techniques, uh, in parentheses, compost act in the U.S. House of Representatives. This far-reaching new federal bill aims to proactively advance composting infrastructure and support across the country 
Specifically, it will amend the Food Security Act of 1985 to officially define and designate composting as a conservation practice. U.S. Composting Infrastructure Coalition, of which the Institute for Local Self-Reliance is a founding member, played a pivotal role in development of the bill. Now we're now I'm reading Brenda Platt's actual words. So this is all a quote. The introduction of the Compost Act is a major step forward for an activity that restores depleted soils, protects the climate, and creates thousands of new jobs in rural and urban communities across the country. A key goal for ILSR was ensuring that the legislation funded projects of all sizes and not just large scale centralized facilities and that only projects that accept source separated compostable materials qualify for funding. These provisions would counter the disturbing trend of large scale facilities accepting contaminated materials that are siphoning business and jobs out of state, worsening truck traffic, shifting the market away from clean segregated materials to programs that inadvertently facilitate contamination and poor quality compost. We were especially pleased that the legislation allocates at least $50 million annually to composting projects that produce less than 10,000 tons of compost per year. And that's a pretty small compost operation. And this funding prioritizes projects that provide living wages, incorporate inclusive hiring practices, and serve disadvantaged and low income communities. Local composting efforts are an important part of building sustainable local, local economies and healthy communities. By helping farmers, entrepreneurs, and local governments build the systems needed to achieve these goals, the Compost Act helps us move toward a more vibrant and sustainable future. So there's a chat apparently here where you can find a link to their press release and a link to email your particular legislator. And so that's basically it. Um, Thank you. The thing is that compost should be produced close to where it's being used. It doesn't make a lot of sense to haul it all over the place. There's all kinds of old landfills that are closed that are perfect sites for compost, but they are now mostly off limits in the state of California because they have people that say, the only thing we wanna have there is a park and you can't have any industrial activity like composting going on on that land. Well, that's just a fair, that's just a crazy thing to do because those old pieces of land are really the cheapest land around and composting needs a fair amount of land. So where are you gonna get it? And you can't put composting real close to a whole lot of people that live somewhere because even when it's done really well and it smells like pipe tobacco or it smells like a forest floor, People get tired of that smell if they have to breathe it all the time. So it's got to be somewhere that's a little more remote. And that's what these old landfills are. So reusing old landfills for compost sites makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Dan. So the when people come to this WAC show and, and advocate to things, I always ask them, how can NICRA help? So Brenda Platt, who we profiled as a pioneer a couple of months ago, has provided to us what I think is sort of the uh, the model of how things go these days. She's given us a link so that you can email your legislator. It'll tell you, it'll figure out who your legislator is and you can email your legislator for why you think this is a good bill, for why you like compost and think it can save the planet. So I think Bonnie has put that into the chat. I encourage everybody to, to use it. Um, and I think that is the, uh, the legislative update. We also usually end the session with, with an open forum discussion. If anybody has issues that they wanna talk about, haven't heard about, think we ought to deal with, 
Um, now's the time to raise your hand and talk about it. And if there aren't going to, if there aren't any, then we're going to adjourn the meeting. And once again, thank Cynthia for for being here, for Nancy for trying to be here, for Dan to taking Nancy's place to tell the story, and for Bonnie to circulate all this on social media because we know that's the that's that's the key thing to advocacy these days. So unless there's anything else. Well, I'm going to thank you too, John. You're uh, doing a brilliant job here and uh, bringing in a lot of really superior content. This is better than most conferences ever try to be. <laughs> and I, I'm not to say that they're not good, but this is just wonderful, this stuff that's going on. Well, well, well thank you. One, one thing that I have that a lot of people in this recycling world don't have is access to lawyers and law stuff because my career has been in law, not recycling. So it may be that we brought too many lawyers in, but I don't think you can ever have too many lawyers. So, so there are good lawyers and not- Oh, so I disagree. Lawyers. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> we only have good lawyers, great lawyers in this show. And, and oh my God, most lawyers are just horrible. Totally good. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm mute you in a second. <laughs> well, we're gonna reform them. We're gonna make them, it's Slaberg into Wonderberg, you know, it's- uh, We'll make them over. We won't all be polyvinyl. All right, anything else anybody want to talk about? David, I, did you want to? Yeah, eventually I'll probably have to talk to you guys separately about trying to figure out how to get waste materials into the construction uh, materials process and getting that, a lot of plastic or other you know products. I have a lot of friends in startups and doing things and we all have big ideas. So I want to talk more about how to funnel waste into construction materials. You know, like my Tyvek wrap, it's made out of plastic number two, you know, that should be water bottles, you know, is there a way to feed into that, those kind of things. So nobody knows, nobody knows any of that better than Dan Knapp, so I think you should feel free to connect with him. And My you know. uh, email is dr.ore at urbanor.com, pretty easy to remember. As in Dr. Orr. I'm Dr. Orr, I have a PhD in sociology. Nick? Yeah, so uh, David, if you remember all that blue gum eucalyptus that was the top of the Berkeley Hills that no one says can be used, uh, that's in downtown Livermore now at Quest Plaza. Uh, we only got about 30 logs. Um, you know, the saying goes, if you don't have anything nice to say about someone, don't <laughs> say it. Uh, there's a handful of people at UC Berkeley that can say nice things about, and uh, well, I can say that uh, people said that, I hear people say a lot more that they want to reuse things, but uh, actions speak a lot louder than words, unfortunately. Um, here is another part of that blue gum eucalyptus within a redwood slab that was sourced locally from Livermore. Um, most of our trees come from planned developments, which uh, weren't really planned very well because they plant redwood trees five or 10 feet from a house. Uh, and that neighborhood in particular uh, has probably hundreds of trees uh, that we get a call probably a few times a year just from that neighborhood. Um, so uh, as for getting wood into the construction industry, there's a lot of different challenges. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, send me an email at nick, N-I-C-K, at bayarearedwood.com. Uh, I work with Lynn King over, who runs the Zero Waste Program. Uh, He's done so much work to try and see this eucalyptus repurposed. Um, he actually had us make these tiny little, this is actually the blue gum eucalyptus right here that we made uh, out of well, that wood. And it's basically kind of some little plaques of what we did to recycle. Um, those trees so so Nick, out. I think David, David is with the city of Berkeley, not UC. No, I'm with UC. Yeah, oh, sorry, right. my, my mistake. Yeah, and I do work with Lynn, so I can yeah touch base with all of you. I owe him an update. Um, lots going on, but we also had that project literally just uh, became live like Saturday. The Quest is a science center in downtown Livermore. So really exciting. And he's worked extremely hard to see that material recycled uh, against a lot of people that said that it couldn't be used. And as I'm sure uh, Dan knows better than anyone else, uh, that people saying that there's no value in trash or things that can't be recycled is uh, 
where it all starts. And, uh, you know, it takes all of us here, like in this meeting to say that enough's enough. Um, so we'd love to connect with you. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, so yeah, and tell Lynn I said hi, please. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Thanks. Nick. All right, with, with that, I'm going to adjourn our meeting until next month, which when I hope that we're gonna talk about resource recovery parks, but you know, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs>